This is going to be my review of episode five of Wheel of Time season two. Now, first, I'm going to recap the episode covering what happened, and a lot happened in this episode. Then I'll break down what I liked, what I didn't, and then I'll give the episode a rating. So join me as I break down all things episode five from Wheel of Time season two, titled Damani. Before we dive in, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. That's all I do here. But let's kick things off with a recap of the episode. And we'll start with Perrin and Elias. Perrin is still with Elias until, of course, he realizes Elias has led him back to Atuan's mill rather than towards his friends at Falm where he thought he was going. Angry, Perrin leaves Elias to go back the other direction to help his friends, and Hopper follows him and sends him a vision of Uno in the cage. Perrin, rather than moving on towards Falm, decides to go back into Atuan's mill so he can find and bury Uno. As he enters, an Aia woman in a cage stops him from making noise with a hammer and getting caught by the White Cloaks. Another man shows up, greets Perrin cordially, warning him to stay away from the Aiel and come to the inn and have a room there as there's a curfew in the village. Perrin and that man have a drink until Perrin realizes that he is a White Cloak and there are White Cloaks and White Cloak questioners in the town. He sees Valda speaking with Bornhold, the man that he was just having a beer with, Obviously, Perrin is a little freaked out by seeing Valda again. Later that night, Perrin sneaks out of the inn, and as he's about to leave the village, he decides to free the Aya woman, who introduces herself as Avienda. When they speak, the White Cloaks surround them, and Perrin and Avienda take out an entire group of White Cloaks. As Avienda is about to kill Dane Bornhald, Perrin stops her and saves his life before they leave the village. Later, they sit down by the fire, and Avienda tells Perrin that she is looking for the Karakarn. But she will follow Perrin for a short time as he saves her life. She explains a small bit about Aiel culture, and she agrees to go with him as he travels to Falm. In Falm, High Lady Suroth arrives back in town and meets with High Lord Turok, who is her superior. He chastises her for taking a town that they're not capable of holding yet. She essentially mouths off to him, and then he has her punished by cutting off her symbolic super long-ass nails and banishing her from his council until her nails grow back. Ishamael, who is also there, has Padon Fane present the Horn of Valir to High Lord Turok. Later, Ishamael and Suroth discuss the events in her rooms, and she appears to challenge him as she lost face and lost influence because he directed her to go to Atuan's mill. He very quickly puts her in her place and then tells her that he has a gift for her. Now in the White Tower plot, Varen arrives in the tower and begins investigating about the girls, not even Egwene. She meets with her brown Aja sisters, meets with Shiriam, and discovers that although Nynaeve, Egwene, and Elaine were technically signed out of the tower, Shiriam doesn't remember that right away, and that's odd, and it appears that the logbook has been altered. Varen suspects that compulsion, a weave of the one power that forces someone to do something against their will, may have been used on Shiriam. Leandrin takes Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine through the ways after she knocked them out at the end of the last episode. They stop at one point on the trip in the ways, and Leandrin speaks with a now-awakened Nynaeve and reveals that she is Black Aja and was attempting to recruit Nynaeve to serve the Shadow as well. Of course, Nynaeve tells her that she would never, and then they end up going on their journey. When the girls and Leandrin leave the ways, they emerge to find High Lady Suroth waiting. Her and Leandrin have a very combative exchange as Leandrin leaves the girls with her, but before she goes back into the way, she frees Nynaeve and releases the shields. This allows the girls to make a getaway. This is Leandrin's way of getting back at Suroth, but Egwene is actually captured. Elaine and Nynaeve eventually make their way to Falm and attempt to find Egwene until they're knocked out by a man who turns out to be a warder for a yellow Aes Sedai named Rima, who happens to be in the city. Egwene is dragged in front of High Lord Turok and collared with a Damani leash as she screams in agony. When Leandrin returns to the tower, she is confronted by Varen, who is very suspicious that she was gone. Of course, Varen does this in a very Varen way, and it doesn't appear that she's that suspicious, but we know that she is. Varen questions her in a very Varen way, and Leandrin seems to be concerned that the girls may have been attacked by bandits and wants to tell the Keeper, but of course Varen sees right through that ruse and sort of plays along. The main plot of the episode, though, is again Rand, Lanfear, and Maureen. Maureen and Rand begin on the run from Lanfear, where at the end of the last episode, Maureen had cut Lanfear's throat. As Maureen had said, Lanfear is revived, however, apparently through the Dark One's powers bringing her back. Maureen and Rand commandeer some horses from a horse trader and set off in the direction of the White Tower. Maureen kills one other remaining horse, so Lanfear can't get that horse and follow them, but Lanfear ends up taking a horse from 
another guy that she kills and then following them anyway. Unknown to Lanfear, Maureen and Rand sent the horse trader in the direction of the White Tower with the horses and then they went back walking towards Kyrian. So they got her off their trail. Back in Kyrian, they go to Moraine's home and meet Oliver and her son Barthanis, who is set to marry the queen. Now they need to stay awake because they're worried Lanfear will find them if they fall asleep due to her ability in the World of Dreams or Teleron Riyadh. While deciding what to do next, Moraine, with the help of her sister after a nice little conversation, determines that Lanfear can be fooled by Rand and they can try to figure out what Lanfear and Ishamael's plans are because she's still in love with Rand as she was in the Age of Legends. Lanfear, who has been waiting in the World of Dreams, meets with Ishamael while she's waiting for Rand to fall asleep. They discuss motivations and the fact that Ishamael has been maneuvering all of the pieces into the places he wants them. Lanfear tells him that of course she will betray him as a joke, but she's obviously very, very serious and he seems to know that. She then mentions the other Forsaken, which was kind of cool. Rand finally falls asleep and ends up in a desert tied to spokes of a wheel with Lanfear sitting on a throne watching. And then the episode ends. So lots of stuff happened. Let's talk about it. Let's start with what I liked. There was quite a bit I liked in this episode. Uh, we'll start with Lanfear. Any doubts that I may have had about Natasha O'Keefe playing Lanfear are completely gone. She nailed the crazy, the powerful, the scary, the lone wolf personality that is Lanfear. I enjoyed almost every single scene that she was in. The opening scenes where Moraine and Rand are running from her had a general feeling of horror, and that was really cool. It made her seem as scary as she should be. And I like that they showed how she came back to life. I know that was a little weird part for me in the end of the last episode. It seems to me like watching this, they had the Dark One resurrect her. I think that's an okay change as if that's what they're doing in this because it avoids having to recast the Forsaken every time one of them dies. And it also makes the Forsaken scarier. I was a little iffy on that, but I'm definitely coming around to it. I definitely also want to see how it plays out going forward. Her interactions with Ashamael to me were amazing. I loved that scene. One of my favorite parts of the books, and I know lots of other people love this too, is all of the meetings and the interactions between the Forsaken. To see them banter back and forth was really cool, and you can certainly see that she has her own agenda that may not align with Ishamael. How about the fact that she also mentioned some of the other Forsaken? She mentioned Grendel, she mentioned Mogidian, and then she mentioned the boys. Is there a fourth female Forsaken? Now I'm just curious also which boys she's talking about. Ferris Ferris continues to be great as a Shamael. He is genuinely scary, but also in a very sane way. We got some of his motivations, and he's truly coming across probably like he was back in the Age of Legends. He's not remotely crazy right now. He's coming across like a great philosopher, which is what he was. He's definitely giving me that kind of vibe, and I'm, I'm okay with it right now. Moraine had a lot to do in this episode, and I'll admit I'm coming around on her storyline. I loved ruthless Moraine killing a horse and commandeering the other horses. She's also really cunning and intelligent which I love to see. It's interesting to see how she battles without the one power. The introduction of Avienda was really cool. Fight scene was great. Ayula Smart kicks some ass. And don't hate me, I, I, I kind of like Dane Bornhold. Varen was finally the Varen I wanted. Her scenes were great. I love the way she played dumb, even though she knew exactly what was going on. That's exactly what I wanted from her. And I thought she was great, especially in her interactions with Shiriam and Leandrin. Those were great. Leandrin continues to be impressive. I, I can't say enough good things. I enjoyed her talk with Nynaeve about joining the Black Aja. I enjoyed a lot her interactions with Suroth. I love that she freed Nynaeve as a way to get back at Suroth. I thought that was very cool. Is it bad I love Leandrin and want more of her backstory now? Let's talk about some of the things I did not like in this episode. First of all, I'm somewhat disappointed in the Shan Chan, and for a few reasons. Let's start with the accent. And yes, yes, I know I said that I liked the accent in the last episode with Alwyn, who was Suroth's voice. Now hearing Suroth herself speak, and Turok's voice have some problems. And I'm not sure whether it's those specific performances or the accent they're being told to use, but it sounded really weird and strange to me. Again, sort of uncanny valley, but also weird. The best way I can describe it is that it, is that it sounds like an old Bruce Lee movie that when he was making movies back in Hong Kong that have been dubbed over in English, it just doesn't seem like realistic in the way they're talking. It doesn't sound right. And if that was intended, fine, but I, I don't think it makes Sean Chan feel foreign to me 
it just sounds strange and weird. I wasn't a fan of it. Somebody else might feel better about it. I just didn't like it. I'm also very much missing Torokin and Grom and the other beasts that the Shan Chan have. I think that's a part of what makes them so menacing. And I understand the CGI implications of having unnatural beasts walking around, but I would like to see them in some capacity. Maybe they're saving that because of the CGI cost and we'll see them later, but it just feels like we're missing one of the defining parts of the Shan Chan. We got to see Pot on Fane, but he was basically a glorified cameo and just brought the Horn of Valir out. I see that they may be slow playing him as a character and he may have another role later, but honestly, that's a detriment to the season, in my opinion, because Pot on Fane could have been a very compelling character and he's just not been present. I'm disappointed we don't have more from him this point. I think it's a waste of a crazy person, a great character, and honestly, one of their better casting decisions. Johan Myers is great as Pot on Fane and we're just not getting him. So this next thing is nitpicky, I will admit it. I just thought there were so many other things that could have been done better than what we got. And what I'm referring to here is Lanfear sewing the woman's mouth shut. That was annoying to me just because that's sort of a world of the dreams thing, not a real life channeling thing. It breaks the lore and I understand that this is an adaptation. It doesn't have to be directly to the lore, but that wasn't necessary. And it's been done in the Matrix, so it, it wasn't even cool to see. If you wanted to show that Lanfear was cruel and was doing something to this lady, there were plenty of things that you could have done there that would have been even more menacing than that, and they wouldn't have changed the lore of the magic system. That just doesn't seem like a good choice to me, and again, it's very small. It doesn't matter, but it annoyed me. So let's talk overall, though. I actually really liked this episode. My problems with it were not big problems. They were annoying problems. I was very entertained watching it. The character moments were really good. I didn't feel like there was any wasted time like in the previous episode. I thought the episode was really well paced. I'm very interested to see what's going to happen next week. So for episode five, I'm going to give the episode a rating of 7.5 out of 10. What did you think of the episode? Let me know in the comments of the video what you thought. Make sure to also like the video and subscribe to the channel to be, and, and of course hit the bell icon to be updated when I release more Wheel of Time content. That's what I do here on this channel. There's tons of Wheel of Time content about the books, about the TV show, all on the channel. You can check all of that out if you want to learn more about the Wheel of Time. Huge thank you to my patrons. You make this channel possible. If you want to financially support the channel, consider checking out the Patreon link in the description of the video. And if you liked this video, I bet you you'll like these ones here too. Thank you for watching and until next time, peace out.